I'm so glad to be with you today to preach to you from God's Word. You're going to think that, uh, that Case and I got together and planned the sermon in the Bible class because, in fact, one time there I was getting a little nervous. I was afraid he was going to take all my material. But uh, I, I think it's going to complement the things that we talked about in Bible class. John chapter 10, verse 10. The latter part of that verse is something that we, I mean, we love that. We preachers do. It says, I have come that they might have light and that they might have it more abundantly. That's why Jesus came. The first part of that verse, we don't like it as much because it's, it sounds kind of scary. And it should sound scary to us as Christians because you see, the thief in this particular uh, part of the verse is talking about the devil. And I, I remember as a younger preacher, I read that and I thought, you know, it seems like it's kind of out of order. I wonder if it's that way in the Greek. Because kill has got to be a lot worse than steal. But in this particular case, steal is worse. Because what the stealing is talking about here is stealing the word of God away from us. There are many people who think, you know, God gave us this big old thick book. And there's some young people out there right now. And listen, I want you to listen. I want you to listen. We're going to talk about some things that uh, I call secret passages. They're not secret uh, because they're not clear. They're secret because we read over them too quickly. And by reading over them too quickly, we miss the message that is there. You know, I, th I think you alluded to uh, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, about the various verses there where Jesus said over and over again, you have heard that it has been said. Then he said, you have heard it has been said. This is a good one. You have heard that it's been said by them of old time. We've always said that. A woman came up to me one time and she said, she said, Brother John, where's that verse in the Bible that says each tub shall sit on its own bottom? Now the principle of each tub shall sit on its own bottom. We've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to study for ourselves. We've got to try to take care of our own family and our, ourselves. It, the principle is there, but that is not a verse in the Bible. Then I was trying to be diplomatic and sweet to her, and so I said, you know, I don't, I don't believe you'll find that in the Bible. Oh, yeah, it's in there. <laughs> you, I said, uh, well, I, I've looked for it, and I've never found it in there. She said, oh, I'll find it for you and tell you where it's found. She has never come back and showed me that verse. But you're going to hear things from people of old time. And uh, like one man said to my grandfather years ago, he said, I know it's got to be true. I'm going to try to say it in the accent my grandfather gave it to, to us in. He said, I know it's got to be true because I've said it a hundred times and I've said it just alike every time. You see, just because you said it just alike a hundred times, it doesn't necessarily make, make it true. The devil comes like a thief to steal. The thief does not come to tear your door down. He does not come to kill you. He comes to steal from you. But if he gets up there to your door and your door is locked, he won't say, oh, well, we'll have to, I have to pick me a different house because this is one of those with the pretty cut glass in it and that's just too pretty to destroy that door. No, he'll break the glass. He'll, he'll crowbar the, 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 the uh, knobs and he'll, he'll get in there because he came to steal from you, but he's willing to destroy to do it. And, and the devil's the same way. He wants to take the Word of God out of our hearts because he knows what the Word of God can do. What I'm going to try to do today is to tempt you to understand the power of the Word of God. Do you not like to read? Don't, don't raise your hand. Some of you may not like to read. But I'm hoping by the end of this uh, uh, sermon that some of you are going to say, I'm going to read anyway. Because there are secrets in there that can make my life better because Jesus didn't, came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. And he does it through the Word. We talked about that today. What's bound in heaven is bound on the earth. When the Holy Spirit through God and Jesus' instruction, gave us the Word of God, then everything that is in it is bound. Everything. Somebody says, well, what about the Old Testament? Everything in there bound? Sure, it's bound. As long as it was in effect. Jesus said again in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, I believe it was, He said, I tell you not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And when it was fulfilled, we no longer are under that law. That doesn't mean it wasn't true. It's just like today we're not under the Noah law. 
We're not all out there behind our house looking for some gopher wood and trying to build a uh, trying to build an ark to save us from a great flood that's going to cover the whole earth because that's already happened. It's been fulfilled. And today we have the New Testament. But we also look to the Old Testament because we have, it's given to us for, a, for an example. And the Word of God is so powerful. And that thief, when he comes to your door and he tears that door down, he goes into your house and, and he came to steal, but he might kill you if you get in his way. See, the devil does not care if you and I live to be 100 years old. He doesn't care, which is not as long as it used to be for me. But anyway, he doesn't care if we live to be 110. How about that? Uh, he doesn't care. He doesn't care if we live to be 110, we're the most healthy person in town. We've got the biggest house and the best cars and a pond and a lake and a boat and the happiest and sweetest grandchildren and sweet wife. He doesn't care. As long as he can steal God's word from our heart. And he's done it to many people in the church. He's done it to many congregations who have given up the word of God. Either the Word of God here or the Word of God here. Uh, I, I thought I can't go up and talk about the Word of God without having an actual, you know, beaten Bible, a, a hand-slapping Bible. But, uh, of course, most of us use the, uh, the PowerPoints, and, the, and it's great that we have that. See, that's some of the good things that uh, technology has done for us. But the Word of God has got to fill our hearts. Jesus said in the earlier part of John chapter 10, he said, you know, there's lots of people that are going to say lots of things to try to lead you away. But my sheep hear my voice. I had a friend who lived in Italy for about a year. And he told me it's one of the most amazing things he ever saw. He saw some shepherds up on, uh, grazing their, their sheep on the side of this mountain. Green grass. He said there were 7,000 sheep. And he said they had horses and dogs and several shepherds. And he said there was one shepherd that yelled out really loud, I maybe with a megaphone for 7,000 sheep. And he said, all the sheep were grazing in this direction. And he said something in Italian. And instantly, all 7,000 of them started grazing this way, on the side of that mountain. They heard the voice of the shepherd, and they followed. But you know, we have a lot of people today wanting to second-guess God. They're wanting to say, well, you know, that tree looks like it'd be good to eat. Can, can you imagine the, the reasoning that, I mean, I, I, it's difficult for me to imagine the reasoning that Eve had as she looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She wasn't even supposed to be looking at it. But she looked at it and the devil told her, in fact, I have a brother-in-law who wrote a sermon, or either he borrowed it from somebody else, I'm not sure. It was entitled, The Knot in the Devil's Tail. Because he told a tale, a story to her, and he put one word in there that God's word didn't have in there. God's word, he said, the day that you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. He put the word, you shall not surely die, and it changed the whole meaning. And Eve looked at the fruit, and she thought it looked good. She thought it was pretty. It reminds me of Jordan. When my, my little Jaden, my little granddaughter, turned one, she had a little birthday cake about this big, about that big. Had one little candle in the middle. She's sitting in her high chair, and Jordan puts it down, and he's watching really close now. He don't want her to burn herself with that little flame. Oh, it's an enticing little flame, isn't it? It looks so pretty. It's so yellow. And it's, it's saying, hello. Jordan turned his head for about a second. And she put her finger right in the fire. Now, he turned around just in time to knock her out of the way so that all it did was turn a little red. And so uh, even to this day, I still say, Jordan, you remember that time you tried to light your little girl on fire? <laughs> But uh, I, I heard that he did a good job here. He is a great gospel preacher. Continue to pray for him. He, you know, he's just getting started. So we're, we're very proud of the work that he's doing. But anyway, why did that happen? Because it looked good. And the devil's always doing that. He's always said, yeah, I know the Bible says that, but the devil wants to change the word of God. Got to hurry, got to hurry. Psalm 119, 105. Now, we love to read this verse too because it's so pretty. The whole long, long, long Psalm 119 has the, the, I think all but one verse, it has either word or commandment or law of God in it. But this is the one that we preachers really like. It says, I think I went too far there. It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my pathway. I tell my family when they go out to, uh, out, we live in the middle of 40 acres and so, uh, when they come outside, especially this time of the year, and it starts getting a little cooler, well, it, 
especially in the spring, when it got a little cooler at night, I said, make sure you turn your flashlights on before you get in the car because the snakes like to come out of the woods and lay on that concrete pad. And I did not tell myself about that recent snake that I saw. It was just chicken snake, but she wouldn't go outside anymore if I told her about that. But the truth is, you need the light to see where you're going. You need a light for it to be in your path. When somebody says, that's right, God's Word is a light to my path. God, God's Word tells me where to go. But, you know, listen to the other verses. It, it says in 100, 119, 100, it said, I understand more than the ancients, than the people of old time. Because I keep your precepts. Verse uh, 101. I have reframed my feet from every evil way that I might keep the Word of God. Are some of you having trouble keeping the Word of God? Is it because you're sinning? I've seen young people change just like that. I've seen teenagers change just like that. They bring their Bible to Bible class. They, 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 they answer questions. They, br they filled out their booklets. And then within two weeks... I remember this little girl, she, she turned 16, she got a boy from in, she did things she should not have done with that boy. And it was just like this, a change in her. About a month later, I waved at her at the Sonic, I believe, and she forgot who she was. She forgot she had, who she had become. And she waved at me like she always had, and then she remembered she wasn't that person anymore. And she slowly drew her hand back in the car because she wasn't John's friend anymore. Because she was living a life of sin. And when you're living a life of sin, you can't hear the Word of God. L listen to this passage. Over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, said the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. If you don't believe in God, if you're here today because your mama made you come, if you're here today because your husband made you come or your wife made you come, or because you don't want to disappoint your grandchildren, but you're living in sin, you're doing those things, that, you're not hearing the Word of God. You don't want to hear it. Because God's Word may say some things that, that you're doing wrong and you need to change. So he says here, I refrain my feet from every evil work. I refrain. Now, a little bit later he's going to say, God's Word is sweet to me. It tastes like honey. <laughs> but it's sweet to the person who loves God and wants to know what God wants them to do. I see it happen all the time with my grandchildren. When, when, they, when they want to do something, I want to make Grandpa happy, they're hurrying to help Grandpa. Sometimes when they get to be teenagers, they're not hurrying quite as fast anymore because they're hurrying to please themselves. Yeah. If we're wanting to please God, then it's going to be sweet to hear what God wants us to do. I keep, he said, I love God's precept and I hate the evil ways. But it's because he kept himself away from those things that were evil. And when we keep ourselves away from those things that are evil, it, it changes the attitude that we have, the things that we do, and what we want to do. In John chapter 8, Jesus said these words, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of the of life. This is what we all need to understand about God's Word. Somebody says, you know, that, that's a thick book. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Yeah, but you know what kind of stuff it's got in it? It's got stuff that'll make our life more abundant. Because that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus knows what we need even before we ask. And that's why every time we ask God for something, we need to say, but Lord, don't give it to me if I don't need it. How many times have I said that? Every prayer just about that I pray and I ask God for something, I say, but now, Lord, you know more than I do, so please give it, don't give it to me if I don't need it. Because I want what is best for me. When my little granddaughter wanted that flame, should he have said, well, she wants it really bad? I'll just let her grab it because she wants it really bad. And there's some people who foolishly say, well, just let them grab it one time. It'll burn them. They won't ever want to do that again. Listen, there's some things young people do that they don't come out of the other side. Drive too fast, drink alcohol, take drugs, immorality. Sometimes you don't come out the other side. Sometimes a person dies. Bad things happen. So we need to find out what God wants us to do and realize that God loves us and that's how he's trying to help us. Man, I don't have much, much time here. So let, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, I'm just going to allude to these verses, and you can read them in their entirety. 
Ephesians chapter 6 has two or three things in, in just a few verses that will help us if we will do exactly what God says. Now, I know young people are saying, yeah, he's talking about those first few verses where he says, obey your parents. I know. Would you like, kids, look at me now, all you kids, would you like to never have any more problem out of your parents? Teenagers, how would you like to never have any more problem out of your parents? I'm going to tell you, the Bible tells you how to do it. It's a secret passage. Not secret because God didn't tell us, but secret because we don't read it or we don't read it all. It says there, obey your parents. That's right. In the Lord. That means as long as they're telling you to do what's right. If they tell you to lie or cheat or steal, you don't do that. Obey your parents in the Lord. He says because that's the right thing to do. Well, you ought to do it because it's right. But you know what? People miss the second part of the verse. Many Christian young teenagers, they do that first part. They obey. But they do it like this. Can you see my eyes? They go. <sighs> Rolling them eyes. I don't even know if I can roll mine as far as some young people can roll their eyes. Or if daddy says, take that garbage out. It's been in here for three days and I've been telling you to take it out. Well, daddy should be sweet to me. Well, he probably was the first two times. And you grab that garbage out of the, out of the trash can and you, and you drag it on the sidewalk until it cuts a hole in it and that pink juicy stuff comes out the bottom, you know, from whatever was in the garbage and it makes a streak on the sidewalk that you can smell for about a week. And you get it out there to the garbage can and they throw it in and maybe the bag rips open and the, they throw it in there and don't close the lid and the possums get in there. You know, but I obeyed you. I took it out. Or mama says, go clean that room and you kick everything under your bed or worse, you put it in your brother's room. You know, you, <laughs> you, you just halfway obey. But see, you missed the second part of the verse. Look at, look at those first few verses. The second part is this. Honor your mother and father that it may be what? Well with you. What? Let me tell you what happens. If you will start doing this, young people, when your mother says, wash the dishes, Instead of going over there all angry because daddy didn't get the dishwasher fixed and you're throwing the cups over there, breaking the handles out and chipping the dishes, you know. Instead of doing that, grumbling all the time about my brother never washes the dishes and he says, you want to take out the trash? You know, both of you are fussing about how much more great of the work you're doing than the other. If you're supposed to honor your parent though, not just do what they say, but honor them, that means you're supposed to say, yes, mother dear, and kiss her on the cheek right there. And then you go wash the dishes, rinse them really good, dry them, and put them up in the cabinet without a chip, if possible. And then say to your mother, I'm through, mother. Anything else you want me to do? What? <laughs> See, the honor part is the half of that, that little section of verses that the young people miss. Let me tell you, if you'll do that, or, or the, the, the boy with the trash, he takes the whole trash can out. And he, puts, uh, he goes and gets the trash out of the little trash cans in the bathrooms. Ew. He even gets it from his sister's room. And, and he takes those things out and he ties the bag and he puts it in there and he closes the lid and he walks back to the house and he even puts an extra trash bag in there. And says, I'm through, Mother dear. Say, yes, Mother dear. Yes, Father dear. If you'll do that, if you really will, I'm not talking about a sarcastic, yes, Mother dear. John told me to do that. You know, not that kind of thing. I'm talking about really honor them. If you will do that, say three to six months, do it consistently. Then one night after they think you're in bed, you sneak to the top of the stairs and listen to your mom and dad, and your mom will be crying. She'll be saying, I don't know what's wrong with her. I think she must be on drugs. She does everything I tell her to, and she's so sweet. <laughs> and then you know what's going to happen to you? Your mama's going to be at Walmart, or better, Target. And she's going to see something you want. And it's not going to be your birthday. It's not going to be Christmas. <laughs> and she's going to say, he or she is so sweet. I'm buying that for them. And it's going to be well with you. See, it's in here. Did you know in Proverbs there's a verse that will tell you how to make 25% better on your, uh, excuse me, a letter grade better and study 25% less? I know because I did it. 
I was in college and there was this woman about, she was really old, she was about 40. <coughs> but uh, anyway, she, she, uh, she said, I made a D on this test. It was advanced English grammar and I made an A on the first test. And I thought, I said, I, I'll give you an idea of something you can do. And I told her this about this verse. She said, I'll try it. I'll try anything. The next test, I barely squeaked by with a B. She made an A on the next two and messed up the curve. Because, you know, it's in here. It's in here. You know, a little bit farther in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, and that's talking about servants, but you know, we're all servants if we've got a job. We're servants because we've been hired to do something. They bought some of our time, eight or ten or how many ever hours you work. And it says, when you work, you don't do it with eye service as men pleasers. You don't do like the, the 18 or 19 year old boy did one time. I had a new double breasted pinstripe uh, gray suit on back in the day and I walked into the restroom and he's in there mopping. He's mopping about this slow. And he looked up and he saw me and his eyes got big. He started mopping. I mean, he was mopping. And he, I thought, it was kind of strange. He looked and said, are you the man? And I said, no, I'm just a regular man. He said, oh. <laughs> hey, I think they were waiting for the inspector or whatever. But anyway, you don't do it that way. It says you do it as though you're doing it to the Lord. You do it like you're working for the Lord. I remember Danny Conaway, he was 6'7". Never, never dunked the basketball until after we had to talk about all this. And that summer, he was baptized. Two weeks later, he had a job. He, he had a job making sidewalks, pouring curbs. I mean, it was hot, hot too, really hot. He came up to me and said, I can't believe that boss man wants me to work like I'm getting paid $10 an hour. By the way, that'd be like $30 or $40 an hour now. And I said, that's ridiculous. He said, I know it. I said, you ought to be working like you're getting paid $50 an hour. By the way, that's still good pay. <laughs> But uh, he said, what do you mean? And I showed him these verses. He was a young Christian. And he said, he said to the Lord, yes, sir, I'll do it. I said, you're not working for the Lord. You're working, you're working for God. And you're showing them how a Christian person can work. A few weeks later, he came up to me with a big grin on his face. And I looked up at him. And he said, he said you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He said, I just got a raise higher than some people that have been there two years. The boss said, I was the best worker you ever had. And I said, he don't even know you're not working for him, does he? You're working for God. Let me tell you something. You, you ought to take the Bible and read it and find out those secret passages God has for you that will make your life better. I, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. I've come that you might have it more abundantly. Those passages are in there. Listen, the Bible is not a science book. But if it says anything about science, it's true. In the 10th grade, my biology teacher said, I'm two rows from the front, Jennifer right in front of me. She said, the appendix and the tonsils are useless tissue. They're vestigial. Did you know some, some, some books are still saying that? And the scientists know it's not true. Anyway, I leaned up to Jennifer and I said, I don't believe that. Because God said when he made us, it was good. By the time I got in college, they had discovered that, that the appendix and the tonsils are not vestigial. They are lymphoid tissue. They help make medicine and protect the body. Somebody says, oh no, I don't have any appendix. Well, that's probably because yours got infected. And, you know, sometimes you have to take them out. But it was probably getting infected protecting you. That, the scientists know that. And I bet Jennifer looked back and thought, you know that John Rice, he was so smart. <laughs> and I was just believing in the Bible. Let God be true and every man a liar. You shall know the truth, John 8, 32. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. What you need to do is be like in Matthew chapter 5. What is it? Verse 6. For the Lord said, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We need to be, teenagers need to be, especially teenagers because we've, you've not been studying very long. If you're a young Christian, you need to be the same way. You need to be like a teenage boy on a refrigerator when it comes to the Bible. You ever seen a mama, you know how the teenage boys do, they got the refrigerator door open, letting all the cold come out, and then they're yelling at you. They're eating two or three different things. They'll even eat carrots if there's nothing else in there but that. But they're eating, and they're saying, Mama, we ain't got nothing to eat. There's nothing in the refrigerator. We need to be that kind of hungry. Why? Because the, the child is wanting to grow. His body wants to grow. And if we're going to grow spiritually, 
If we're going to grow as we should, we've got to know what God's Word is. There's so many people that don't want to read it because they don't want to find a verse that tells them that they can't do a certain thing. Like that woman that called me one day, she said, uh, Preacher, I want to come down there and be baptized. Uh, do, do you have time? Listen, preachers always got time for that, <laughs> right? And I said, well, yes, ma'am. She said, but before I come down, I, I want to ask you, am I going to have to quit my drinking and my party? And I don't think she was thinking about sweet tea and birthday parties. And I said, let's talk a little bit about repentance before you come down or when you come down. And we talked about repentance and she didn't want to be a Christian. It was sad to me. She wanted to be saved. And there's a lot of people in the world that want to be saved, but they just don't want to do what God says. And you know, we can't be saved without doing what God says. We just can't. When I was in college, I lost my faith in God altogether. I'm going to tell you why I'm a member of the Church of Christ, okay? I told myself I'd never be a hypocrite. I lost my faith. I said there was no God. And thankfully, I didn't go drinking and carousing and doing those things. I'm thankful I didn't. Probably a little while longer and I would have. But I remember one Sunday night, I said, I'm not going to go anymore. I'm not going to go to worship anymore. Because I don't want to be a hypocrite. And then I got to thinking, well, you know, there's some pretty girls at that church. Uh, and if I want to be a hypocrite, I can be a hypocrite because there's no God. I walked in, I sat on this side, very back row. As I came in, I'd, I'd argued with myself, with the temptations that the devil was putting before me. I'd argued with him until I missed the announcements, I missed the singing, I missed the, uh, the Sunday night Lord's Supper. And I sat down on that back row, and there's a man coming up in the pulpit. A, a guy by the name of uh, Henderson. I never heard him before and never heard him since. A couple of years ago I heard he died and he didn't even know what he did for me. But you know what his lesson was on that night? Is there a God? And he used science and the Bible. I went home that night. I looked up in the sky and the moon was full and the stars were everywhere. And I looked up there and I said, I am no fool. Somebody had to make this. And I began looking at all kind of religions. I said, God or gods, whoever you are, help me find you. And I studied Eastern religion. I studied Buddhism. I, I'm studying it more now because I, when we go to Cambodia, that's their national religion. But I remember one, there was one statue of Buddha, maybe as tall as this building. And they couldn't rub his belly, so they'd kiss him on the big toe. And over about a thousand years, they kissed his big toe off five times. And I said, ah, I'm not going to study anymore about that because I don't want a God that can't even hang on to his own big toe. You know. I looked at Eastern religions and some of them they inflicted pain upon themselves and one man would cut a little of his finger off every day, each finger and each toe and after 20 days he came back to this other finger and he had cut his fingers off. It showed a picture of him up to the first knuckle and I thought the God who gave us the body with such sensitivity that if you've touched something that's hot, before you feel the pain, your body will jerk back, your arm will jerk back and sometimes you don't even know what's happened. You put your foot in a tub of hot water and it jerked, your leg came back up over your head almost and you didn't know what was going on until it started stinging. God did not want us to be cutting our fingers off. He didn't. So finally I studied the Bible and I tried my best to disprove it. I was going to a Christian evidence class at the time in school. <laughs> the teacher thought I was the best student because I kept saying, now wait a minute. Wait a minute, Brother Curley. And he said, that's a very good question, Brother John. He had two PhDs and four master's degrees. And, he, and when he read the Bible, he read it from the Greek. And man, when it was over, I said, the God of the Bible has to be the true God. It's the only one that makes sense. The Bible's not a science book, but if it says anything about science, it's true. The Bible is not a history book, but if it says anything about known history, it's true. The Bible is not a sociology book, but if it says anything about the way a society should react to one another, it makes for a great society. The Bible is not a financial book, but it has over 3,000 verses that tell you about your finances. I don't know about you, but I need to read them again. The Bible can help us and teach us. And I came to the conclusion the God of the Bible was the true God. And here's why I'm in the Church of Christ. True member, if you're visiting, I want to tell you. The true member of the Church of Christ. Now, there's some of them that are not true members. That's the way it is in every church anywhere. But the true members of the Church of Christ believe that there's one God. Jehovah God. And they believe that God gave us the Bible through the Holy Spirit. And if God gave us the Bible, we believe we ought to read it. You can call that here and if you want to. But we believe you ought to read it. Now, if I, if I don't believe it came from God, I won't read it. If I don't believe there's a God, I won't read it. But if I believe there is a God and He gave us the Bible, I'm going to want to read it, read it even if I don't like to read because I'm going to want to know what God wants me to do. 
I'm, I'm thinking God looks out for me and He cares for me and He'll help me. And He will. Sometime I'll have a subject on my mind that, that's troubling me and I want to read the Bible to see if God has uh, information in there for me. And He does. God can help us to know what we need to do. And then when we hear it, we're going to believe it because it came from God. When we believe it, we, if we really believe it, the mark of believing is that we change our lives. It's called repentance. Repentance. And when we repent and people ask us, why, why are you different from what you used to be? We're not going to say, well, I'm just a good guy. We're going to say, Jesus made a difference in my life. You know, the one that died on the cross for his sins and rose the third day, that's called confession. But one day we're going to want to start all over. We're going to want all of our sins washed away. And we're going to go to passages like Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, which says, we're buried with him by baptism into death. And then we're raised up to walk in a new life. You want a new life? Somebody says, well, that, that seems kind of strange. Listen, Jesus died for us. He, he could save us any way he wanted to, and he did. He told us he wanted us to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized in the water. And Galatians 3.27 says we're baptized into Christ because it's Christ that does the saving. Don't believe anybody if they tell you the church of Christ believes you're saved by baptism. We believe you're saved by Jesus when you're baptized because Jesus said do it. Jesus' resurrection made it possible for us to have our sins forgiven. Our resurrection from the water is the point where we are saved. That's why I'm in the church of Christ today, because true members of the church of Christ say, I believe you ought to do what the Bible says. I just want to encourage you. Snack on the Word of God. Young people, take a Bible to school. If your school will not allow it, sneak one in. Put it in your locker. Every now and then, stick your head in there and get one of those little, those little flashlights that you can turn on and read you a verse from the Bible so it'll help you. Read Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Those are the epistles. They're the Proverbs of the New Testament. And they will help you to be what you need to be. Listen, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, our final verse, the Lord told us that our life would be better because we serve Him. He told us that we would have more joy by serving and following Him. Yeah. Because He cares for us. And that's what the Lord wants to do. Romans chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Listen, go home and start reading the Word of God. It'll change your life. It'll fill you with the things you need to be filled with so that you can be excited about God and His way. If you have a need, won't you come now?